So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had three wonderful presentations today and we are looking forward to this presentation. So I would like to start by saying my name. My name is Juana Suarez and I am the director of the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program at NYU University. And I respect respectfully acknowledge that the university is located in ancestral Lenape homelands. And it rec we recognize the long standing significance of these lands for Lenape nations past and present. We are also conscious that New York City has the largest urban native population in the United States. We believe that historical awareness of indigenous exclusion and erasure is critically important and we are committed to working to overcome their, effer their effects in our educational institutions. So thank you so much for being here and for your interest in the work and research of our students and the contributions that they are doing to the field of archiving uh, and preserving moving images. Congratulations to all the students who presented yesterday, the student um, who is presenting today and the student that will be presenting tomorrow. We are looking forward to what you have to share with us. We do have to say that we learn a lot in these presentations. It's always amazing the level of sophistication of research and the choice of topics um, and the avant-garde nature of, the, of your proposals. I would like to take the opportunity to um, thank on behalf of the MIA program to every person in the program per se, staff, professors, adjunct faculty, the MIA community, cinema studies, colleagues at other universities, institution, institutions and organizations that had hosted our students for different assignments, for internships, et cetera. And every colleague that um, over the course of these two years had supported, taught and mentored this cohort of students. We also want to acknowledge that due to the pandemic, we acknowledge that the circumstances of research and course, coursework for this graduating class have been challenging and um, students have done most of the coursework and internships online, but we are very proud of the students' resilience and their ability to work under very difficult circumstances. And we can proudly say that their love for the profession and their commitment to audiovisual legacies transpired in their flexibility. So congratulations again. We have two presentations today to be rescheduled or postponed. We will keep everybody posted through our usual uh, means of communication. So this is going to be our only presentation today. Um, questions for this presentation, but the way we are going to operate this morning, and I'm going to say this before I present David Gris. Um, David has prepared for us a video, so he will provide a little bit of context. Then we are going to play the video. The, David is going to drop the link in the chat and um, we will give you time to watch it. And there will be a slide announcing at what time we are resuming. And the questions, the Q&A period will be handled, handled via the chat. The student will rephrase the question for us and proceed to respond. Um, so now let me introduce our speaker today. I am very glad to introduce David Gris. Um, who came to NYU MIAP with a BFA with an emphasis in sculpture and printmaking from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And um, through the course of uh, their career at the university, they have worked at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Moving Image Archive, MARMIA, that's Baltimore, the Joey Sachs Collection in Kentucky. Have a lot of collection, connections to Kentucky in this program. And uh, with the Indie Collect at uh, New York, and uh, uh, David has been a very active member of the community, a person that is always sending us very interesting news and a great addition to conversations on uh, underground cultures, self sustained archives, and um, other ways of practicing archives culture. So um, 
it comes as no surprise that the title of his presentation is A DUI Approach, Creating Access to Home Moving Efforts, Documenting the Art and Life of Kent Bellows. And it's a thesis project that I have had the pleasure to direct. So I would like to acknowledge um, that David, it has been a real pleasure working with you in this project. I have learned a lot. You got the floor. All right, a lot of pressure is the only presentation. <laughs> uh, thanks, Juana. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure um, having you as my advisor as well. Um, so yeah, my name is David Griss. Uh, I'm a student, I'm an artist, I'm an archivist. Uh, in 2015, I co-founded uh, Human Trash Dump, which is an open archive that invites contributions of digital content in the form of text, audio, video, and more uh, to in interrogate the society in which we live in. Um, I'm here today to talk about the DIY approach my family has used to preserve our home movies and how I have contributed new workflows and procedures to create digital files of these moving images, as well as excerpts that document the art and life of my late uncle, Kent Bellows. Um, before I dropped a link into the chat, uh, I also wanted to read a quote um, from this book, Thinking in Pictures by Temple Grandin. Uh, I think in pictures, words are like a second language to me. I translate both spoken and written word into full color movies, complete with sound, which run like a VCR tape in my head. So now I'm gonna drop the link into the chat. Um, if you want to log off of Zoom, you can, or you can stay on the call, but the video is about um, 35 minutes long. So when you finish it, please come back and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Hello, my name is David Griss and I'm a Master of Arts candidate in the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program at New York University. This is my pre-recorded thesis presentation, a DIY approach, creating access to home movie excerpts documenting the art and life of Kent Bellows. Before I begin my presentation, I want to make some acknowledgments. Uh, this thesis is dedicated to Vernon F. Bellows and Kent Bellows, uh, my grandfather and my uncle, respectively. I want to also say thank you to Robin Griss, my mother, Jim Griss, my father, Phyllis Bellows, my grandmother, who just turned 95 in March, Elizabeth Lamb, my partner, Bellows, Gris, Wesselman family, uh, NYU MEAP, Juana Suarez, my thesis advisor, Joey Skaggs, a fellow artist, and Judy DeRose, a film producer and archive manager for the Joey Skaggs collection. Judy and Joey are two people that I worked with over the summer of 2020 in a virtual internship to do a collection assessment of the work uh, of Joey Skaggs and his collection. Um, it was through that internship that I really was inspired to take a deeper look at my family's home movie collection and really uh, hone in on um, content that was related to um, my uncle, my late uncle Kent Bellows, and, and realize that maybe that this material could be uh, could be and should be uh, accessible to other artists, to other people uh, in the world. So I wanna say a special thank you to those two. We need an instrument, we need an instrument to take a measurement, to find out if loss could weigh. We need to know value, we need to place value in case it all comes true. Could it be loss could weigh? This is an excerpt lyric from uh, the song 
instrument by Fugazi. Um, their lead singer, Ian Mackay, uh, is been uh, is historically uh, known for his DIY approach, a do-it-yourself approach to creating music, uh, and I'm sort of extending that idea here um, in sort of a punk uh, way. Uh, you know, outside thinking of things outside of an institution, how things really exist in the world, um, who has access to things, um, how are people able to create uh, their work, um, and oftentimes without the support of institutions or other, um, you know, wealthy individuals. So I want to make, uh, I'm putting that here, putting this slide here uh, to sort of re-emphasize this DIY mindset that I'm looking at. So before I really get into the details of the of um, the project, I want to first give a preservation road or presentation roadmap here. A lot of p words. Um, first, I'm going to give a, a project introduction to uh, Kent Bellows, and then I'm going to for part one, I'm going to talk about the Bellows Gris Wesselman home movies, um, sort of the initial preservation methods made by the family, um, and then. Uh, my intervention or my advice to the family uh, starting in 2019 into the collection. Um, I really want to emphasize here that this collection uh, has been, you know, taken care of from the beginning, um, which is something that is uh, really wonderful. Um, and doesn't always happen with home movies. Um, you know, sometimes for various reasons they end up, um, you know, facing neglect. Whether it, you know, whether there's no one to take care of them, or there's, or no way to take care of them, or, or no one is interested in taking care of them, or you know, any number of of these different situations that happen. So, um, this collection has, you know, has thankfully been sort of. Uh, stewarded the entire uh, entirety of its time. Um, and then in part two, I'm going to talk about the Kent Bellows art content. I'm going to talk about um, how much there is, uh, who the prospective audience is, uh, con uh, categories that I've identified, workflows that I've created to make the excerpts, uh, an excerpt example, and future preservation and access uh, priorities. And then I'm going to take questions and comments. Okay, so project introduction to Kent Bellows. On your left here uh, is an image of Kent Bellows in his 3303 Leavenworth Street studio. Uh, he was predominantly known uh, in the commercial art world as uh, an artist that did meticulous renderings um, through the medium of, of painting and, and drawing primarily. Um, almost, some people call it photorealism, some people call it superrealism, um, but his style was uh, very detail, uh, very detail oriented, very detailed in the renderings. And that was what he was uh, best known for. Uh, his work's been collected by museums like the Met uh, and other uh, museums throughout the U.S. and institutions and private collections. On the right here, uh, you have an image of me sitting in front of that very same easel in that very same space in 2018, uh, several years after he had passed away. Uh, I'm using that these images here to you know illustrate this connection that I feel like uh, my uncle and I have. Um, he was one of my earliest influences. Uh, one of my earliest visual cues into seeing what it was like to be a living, working artist. Um, you know, he he let me hang out at his studio. We'd go and look at, you know, what he was working on. He was very open and engaged. So part one is the uh, Bellows, Gris, Wesselman home movies. And I'm calling them home movies. I know that there are home videos technically in this collection as well, but I'm sort of using home movies here as a larger um, categorization of all of the audiovisual material. So 1940 to 1980 is the eight millimeter Super 8 films. 
and then 1986 to 1996 are the VHS tape recordings, and then 2006 to 2013 are mini DV tapes. And on your left here, you have a GIF or a GIF of Vernon F. Bellows proudly proclaiming that this is our first tape. And this is a GIF or a GIF that I made uh, of the first VHS tape recording uh, in 1986. So initial preservation methods, 1986 to 2015. Um, I don't know much of what took place before 1986, so I sort of left that up to sort of an assumption or an unknown. Um, I do know that for the most part, source formats have been kept in a cool and dry environments in each family's respective homes. For the VHS tapes, uh, Vernon F. Bellows would um, slip a sheet or multiple sheets of notes that he had created, extensive notes, into each uh, cardboard sleeve of each VHS tape. He would include things like a timestamp for when certain content started, dates, other descriptive uh, information about what was on the tape, uh, as well as descriptive information about what was on the tape, but maybe wasn't actually recorded, such as in this particular um, note here, he has written with an a denoted with an asterisk that uh, one of my uncle's paintings that he was filming earlier uh, ended up selling for uh, $30,000 in Chicago. Um, the Bellows 8mm and Super 8 films were, trans were probably transferred to VHS tape by a vendor. I'm not quite sure about that, and I have yet to physically locate the source elements. Uh, the Gris VHS tapes include handwritten notes by Robin Gris that also describe the recorded content. Uh, the Gris Super 8 films were transferred to VHS by projecting them against a wall and then recording them with a VHS camcorder. And then in 2012 until 2019, uh, VHS tapes were being transferred to recordable optical disc. You can see uh, with a machine similar to this, on the right you can see uh, some of the recordable optical discs on the floor with the VHS tapes. Uh, it makes sense that this, this happened um, because people, wanted to, uh, people from the family wanted to be able to view um, the tapes, but they didn't, maybe didn't have a VHS deck or they wanted something that was a newer technology uh, that they could play in their DVD players that they had. So this makes sense uh, in theory, but I, I learned um, in my initial studies in 2019 that recordable optical disc is not a preservation, a recommended preservation format. So upon learning that, I decided to you know tell my family, let's wait or stop what we're doing here with transferring these uh, VHS to recordable optical disc and see if we can come up with a better solution. So in 2019. Uh, I, I began to devise a way to, you know, get these home movie uh, recordings into uh, digital files. So this, you know, this workflow process was heavily influenced by uh, Ashley Bluer uh, and her minimal viable station documentation. If you haven't seen that, I highly suggest taking a look at it. Uh, basically, it's saying that, you know, preservation can be expensive, uh, it can be hard to get equipment, um, there's all sorts of different barriers to um, different groups of people who, you know, who don't have lots of money um, to then, you know, sort of purchase these, these equipment, track down these pieces of equipment and purchase them. Um, and so the, the, the playing field isn't very level. So. I wanted to, you know, understand that and then sort of get what I could, the equipment that I could find, track down what I could find for, you know, within a budget, a non-existent budget. And what I came up with was I ended up purchasing a Canopus ADVC uh, 100 and a mini DV uh, camcorder. Both were used. Uh, I purchased them both off the internet. And then um, my dad already had a 
Firewire card installed in his Windows computer. Um, so we were able to start um, creating digital files of the VHS tapes and the mini DV tapes. Uh, also during this time, I had recommended that um, Super 8 films uh, be scanned and that was done uh, for at least for the Gris films and hopefully it will be done for the Bellows films if I can find them in the future. So after that process of which is still ongoing but after processing you know nearly 200 VHS tapes and a handful of, of mini DV tapes uh, thanks to my dad for, for doing all that work um, I sent him an external hard drive from Brooklyn uh, to Omaha and he you know, moved everything onto the hard drive that he had transferred and sent it back to me. Uh, and then, you know, with that hard drive now uh, in my possession, I was able to sort of get these counts uh, of what was on there, uh, sort of get an initial idea of, of, of numbers here. So I've got 185 video files now, uh, 73 image text files, which uh, is primarily the scanned uh, notes from my grandfather Vernon F. Fellows and my mother Robin Griss and then there was just two born digital audio files uh, that were also on the hard drive. That brings me into part two, the Kent Bellows art content, 1950 to 1996. Again, this time frame is when Kent is living, Kent Bellows is living, um, and he is talking about his work and his work is being documented by uh, Vernon F. Fellows. On the left here, uh, you have a still image from the Bellows Gris Wesselman home movies of the outside of Kent studio uh, at 3303 Leavenworth Street in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, this was taken in 1986. Uh, when he got a hold of the building, it was completely gutted and um, which he wanted uh, somewhat, something he could start from scratch with uh, to then build out and renovate and create his uh, dark room downstairs in the basement, a working dark room, you know, ground floor. He could build his sets that he built to then take photographs uh, of models or, or sort of these, whatever he wanted to do uh, to sort of create uh, structures that would then be, you know, a, uh, drawn or rendered to be added into his, his paintings or drawings. Um, and then he you know, had a space in the back where he, he lived and, and worked on his, uh, at his easel. And then uh, after he passed away, um, this building um, sort of became sort of, what do we do with this? Uh, you know, what are we gonna do with all the content inside and how do we you know, move forward as a family? And, and so, my uh, Aunt, De Aunt Deb Wesselman and my mother, Robin Griss, decided they would uh, figure out how to start an arts nonprofit. And I can get really detailed about this, but I'm going to keep it brief for this presentation's sake. Um, it's all in my thesis paper. But uh, long story short, uh, they started an arts nonprofit to turn this building into a public facing building um, that would offer. Uh, a me after school mentoring to high school age students. Um, so local artists would become mentors and local teenagers would become the mentees. Um, and that uh, process is now, that process and that, or that program and this building are now um, under the management uh, of the Jocelyn Art Museum, which is a, a local museum in Omaha. So they control the building now, uh, but the contents that belongs to uh, my uncle that it's, is still there uh, belongs to the family or the estate of Kent Bellows, which um, is currently being ran by uh, Phyllis Bellows, who I mentioned earlier. There's things that are left in the building uh, like his back studio space, which he saw the photo of me. Um, so that's sort of left that way um, so people can understand how he you know, created work. Uh, and then some of the stuff that he had built and his, his dark room is sort of kept the same way. And uh, some of the stuff he had built in the, the big main room in the front is still, there's elements of that that's still there. 
so yeah, it's open to the public as well. They have uh, art exhibitions and, and classes, like I said. So that brings me then to who would be interested in this content, uh, prospective audiences. So definitely I think the, um, that artists would be interested in maybe not necessarily, not just the content, but you know, this process that I'm putting together, you know, that I'm, that I'm looking at, I'm trying to sort of create uh, this thesis paper as sort of a guide for a fellow artists um, students and mentors of the Kent Bellows mentoring program under an, an unrepresented artist, emerging artist, mid-career artist, and artist estates, uh, home movie enthusiasts, art historians, curators, conservators, because there are times in the recordings where uh, Kent Bellows is talking about um, you know how he did something or how he, he created a certain element in the, the work. So if you know, if a, if a painting or drawing were damaged, maybe um, that information would be valuable to a conservator. Um, archives, uh, Nebraska Historical Societies and universe, University Special Collections, uh, museum collections that uh, have Kent Bellows' work in their collection, such as the Jocelyn, the Museum of Nebraska Art, uh, the Met here in New York, and other uh, museums as well. You know, through looking at these digital files, I was able to find uh, 25 uh, files that audiovisual files uh, that I identified with Kent Bellows art content, and there were 51 occurrences of that content throughout um, those 25 files. Um, there's also again content that was created, uh, other content as well, 15. Uh, files and 15 occurrences, but those are on um, those are were created after uh, his death. So I'm at this point really focusing on uh, content where he was uh, alive and living. Um, so I to help myself uh, sort of think about these excerpts, I uh, identified categories for myself to sort of help me think about it a little bit differently or you know, in different groups. Um, and sometimes these categories will overlap with each other. There'll be you know, a piece of an excerpt that will fit all three of these categories or fit two of them. So it's sort of um, can be uh, an overlapping thing. Uh, so ideas and concepts, art life process, and commercial art world. Uh, ideas and concepts are um, involved uh, you know, recordings where Kent Bellows talks about where an idea came from. He often cites reference material or insight into what certain symbols or gestures or, or content in the artwork might mean to him uh, in the art life process. Uh, these are recordings where he's showing or talking about artwork in any stage of completeness. So often, uh, you know, a painting would be documented multiple times in multiple stages. Um, so he's also talking about process and technique to complete an artwork. Uh, and then commercial art world is uh, where he is sharing um, his thoughts, feelings, or experiences within the commercial art world. Uh, he was very candid in these home movie recordings uh, about how he felt about the art world uh, and being a part of it. So in order to create these uh, excerpts, I came up with a workflow. The canopies that you saw in the earlier workflow for creating the digital files uh, ended up creating DV files that were fairly large. Um, so I wanted to make them smaller uh, and make them into you know a format, a current format. So I transcoded those. I first transcoded those DV files to uh, MP4 files with Handbrake, uh, and then I took uh, those MP4 files and put them into iMovie and sort of edited down, you know, these two hours or three hours down to uh, chunks that were closer to three or five minutes um, and decided, you know, what made the most sense to create uh, an excerpt, you know, what to include. And then I took those, uh, I exported that MP4 file and then uploaded it to uh, a program called Trint, uh, which uses artificial intelligence to transcribe um, audio in the, the video file or just audio on its own. 
Um, and then after it's transcribed, I went back in and, and edited um, the transcription for, for errors. And then from that, I exported um, subtitles, uh, a subrip file, and a docx file. So just the text file and then a subrip file which had timecode uh, embedded in it. So it would, you know, the subtitles would play at the correct time during the uh, video file playback. And then from there, from, from both of these, you can see here, I had just the video file and then I have these docx and subrip files. And then I created sort of um, another version which was an, a video file with the subrip file burned in. Uh, so the subtitles were permanently uh, affixed to the video file. So when you play the video file, the subtitles are always there. Um, but I also kept uh, a video file separately uh, on its own that didn't have the, the subtitles burned into it. So the final deliverables for each excerpt are one video file, uh, like I said, on its own, two text files, one Word doc and one subtitle subrip file, and then one video file with the subtitles burned in. And this is to be able to, you know, I can upload this to a YouTube account or something like that, Internet Archive, and then I can upload the subrip file with that to sort of create the subtitles. Or if there's not going to be the, you know, the Internet's not going to be present or it's going to be in a physical space, maybe I want to be able to, for like a teaching aid uh, for students, I want to just have those subtitles burned in. So then I would provide um, that video file with the subtitles burned in. Um, so there's no concern over over that uh, over losing that that information the the text uh, element to it and then the word document's great because you can just sort of you know scan through it or, or search through it on its own and so here is an excerpt that I want to show you this particular excerpt uh, is from a, a drawing uh, that was later purchased by the Met uh, you can see here on the right um, the Met's website. Uh, referencing the same uh, drawing that's in this home movie excerpt. Um, and then I've also got included a note here in bold that was actually from the handwritten notes of Vernon F. Fellows, uh, which he writes, uh, 2 1988 study with Angie for new painting with abstract in the foreground. And that is important because it not only gives you the exact date, but it also tells you um, that the intention for this drawing was for it to actually be a study for a painting. And Kent Bellows actually does say that in this particular video. And he also talks about his thoughts about uh, realism versus abstraction. Um, and he gives a lot of information about that uh, abstract in the foreground that I think is really important and relevant uh, to the work itself. So I'll let you watch that. Um, and it will have the subtitles in the bottom of the video. Okay, I see. Of course, it's not a very good shape for... Television. <laughs> no. It's the exact opposite of what it should be. Let's see how good I can do here with it. Yeah. That's a sketch it can't just didn't three days and he's going to send it off or send it to the packaging people tonight so he brought it over to show it to me and trying to get it on tape here okay you got it boy <laughs> Neato. Uh, now you're gonna, it'll be framed back there, right? Yeah. I don't frame these little ones. I just uh, am intrigued by the idea of this abstract expressionist oil painting rendered eventually in egg tempera. I think that's going to be because I want to do a painting of this. Oh, a painting of this the same. Study for a painting. Oh, yeah. it's a study for a painting. Yeah. yeah, I see. It's just a sketch, right? Just a lousy three Just days. a lousy sketch. <laughs> well, that'd make a great painting. And that the background is... A painting by a friend of mine, an abstract painter, John Sparagana. 
But I think it's neat because there's a real irony in uh, using a, another artist's work to kind of augment one's own expression. Plus, the sort of a uh, funny uh, paradox in that on the one side of the spectrum it shows the humility of the realist who is submissive to the motif even if it's another man's art. I mean I was very careful to copy John's painting as closely as I could. And on the other end of the, of the spectrum it, the arrogance of the realist who figures it he can contain everything, even abstraction, and of course that's my real position. And yeah, yeah. I like I've it. always felt realist art can contain abstraction. Abstraction, by definition, cannot contain realism. Yeah, so. good point. Yeah, I like that. Right. I tell you, it's fascinating. I, I love the background in your drawing. I thought the painting was. <laughs> <laughs> I like it better in my drawing than I do. Well, in I do too. Believe me, because I were really. I thought the painting itself was just so much mud. Oh, I disagree with that. But. Well, maybe I didn't give it enough time to really study it. But. Okay, I'm out of here. Good. I'll bet I got some. And so future preservation and access of these materials some of the, the main, I, I sort of selected three main action points. Uh, I go in a lot more detail about some of the ethical quandaries of sort of um, creating access to these sort of private moments that may have never meant to be public, uh, made public. Um, if you're interested in those kinds of things, um, we could talk more about that later or um, I'd be happy to share my paper with you. But sort of, again, these sort of three key things I'm thinking about um, right now are locating the source uh, materials or elements for the uh, bellows 8mm and Super 8 films and making sure that those are uh, around so I can get scans of them because those initial videos in particular or initial films in particular uh, have some of the earliest uh, recordings of, of Kent uh, Bellows working at an easel as a teenager and I think they're really important and should be scanned. And then I want to also work with the family more on figuring out ways to uh, do things like implementing a metadata standard such as the an NDSA standard. So thinking about how to uh, you know really describe this content further, understand like uh, where it's all located, really understand where it's located because again right now it's sort of a little fuzzy, especially with COVID I wasn't able to really do a, a proper like collection assessment um, and really had to go off of information that was given to me um, by my mother and my uh, Robin Gris and my father Jim Gris, which was great and really helpful. But I, I want to be able to sort of you know get a better handle on, on on what's there, how it's being you know stored, and and all those things. And then now that I have digital files uh, of these uh, home movie recordings, I'm going to need to be continuing a continuation of the digital preservation practices. Um, Digital preservation itself is never really done, uh, like most archiving processes. Um, you know, there's certain tasks that can be completed, but the actual, um, you know, continuation of, of these things, uh, sort of a, a, an effort that, go, that will go, extend beyond my life, um, which also means that people in my family will also have to sort of understand the things that I'm doing uh, or be, they'll have to be communicated to then, you know, so someone in the future can then take over. But those, some of those things with the digital preservation uh, include uh, storage of material. Uh, you know, you have hard drives that can become obsolete after three to six years. And then you have like uh, things like fixity and checksums, uh, which means like you have to make sure that, you know, the digital files integrity is intact. So doing like uh, a you know semi-regular or regular checksums to make sure that you know uh, there isn't a flip bit or bit rot uh, within the digital files of the collection, um, and yeah, just make sure you know ensuring the overall integrity of these uh, these digital files that I have now or that the family has now that the collection has now. And so I want to end this presentation with uh, a Robert. Henry quote from the art spirit 
because I think that uh, art and archiving for me have had a lot of things overlap and a lot of things in common about care and value and and uh, expression and creative expression and how we how we look at that um, as a society and as individuals and how we think about ourselves uh, in the world. So when we know the relative value of things, we can do any with anything with them. We can build with them without destroying them. Under such conditions, they are enhanced by coming in contact with each other. The study of art is the study of the relative value of things. The factors of a work of art cannot be used constructively until their relative values are known. Unstable governments, like an unstable, like unstable works of art, are such as they are because values have not been appreciated. Um, and then I'm using this picture here of Kent Bellows Cemetery Stone uh, in Blair, Nebraska. He was cremated, but there's a stone there, uh, and I'm just wanting to further illustrate his uh, his commitment to to being an artist. He lived his life as an artist, and we wanted to honor that as a family. And now I will take questions or comments. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, David, I think folks are back. So if you want to start the Q&A section of 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 this of this presentation as discussed this is self-moderated so questions should be in the chat and um, David will read them aloud before answering yeah sounds good um, I want to real quick just uh, draw attention to a human trash dump event that's happening tonight as we're waiting for questions um, we have a virtual screening of the work of Preacher Our Son. Um, it's work that's uh, that he created from 2011 to 2014, uh, part of his one-man series. Uh, and you can check that out on our twitch.tv uh, uh, link there on the right, uh, Human Trash Dump channel. Uh, and yeah, so let's get to questions. If you wanna put that link into the chat. Yep, I'll dump, it. The, yeah. I'll dump okay. it in there. All right. I, was, I, was like, I gotta wait for the scroll of the, <laughs> yeah. the before the questions start. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, one from Kelly. I think this is the first question. <clears throat> what advice would you give to an archivist who are working with artists? Um, that's a good question. I think sort of like the thesis uh, is sort of meant to, the paper component of this is sort of meant to help um, sort of jog some questions. Um, for art, artists and archivists and people who are working with like a limited resource or limited budget. Um, I'm not sure what particular individual piece of advice I would give, but I would, I would urge people to um, start the process sooner than later, um, not wait for um, an institution to, you know, come along and say your work is valuable. Um, and so, I would say that's like a huge piece of advice I would give is to um, start doing it now. And that's sort of actually inspired by um, a webinar that I went to um, uh, for Asada. Um, and they were talking about how with family home movies and family archives to not wait, um, do what you can with what resources you have. Um, I'm, uh, Maddie asks, I'm wondering what you see for the future of this collection. I know you mentioned the studio community space, but how do you envision this collection persisting? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I would like to eventually, so with the content that I've identified, um, I wanna go back to the family and say like, and show them this is sort of 
what I'm thinking in terms of Kent Bella's excerpts, um, what of this uh, material feels like it should be restricted and what, what if it seems like it could be, you know, of use to the public. Um, I've already sort of made some preliminary thoughts on that, but I'd like to get the family's input. Um, so that's sort of one of the, the next big steps after um, maybe once I'm able to meet in person with people and go back to Omaha, um, but over the phone or, you know, over email is how we've been working. So we'd probably keep doing that. Um, so either, and so, yeah, so somehow there'll be a, you know, a compilation of, of these, these videos that I want to put together. So it, whether it's a digital video that's available on the internet or a digital video that's available through the studio space, um, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, from CK Ming, uh, question, I think the notes are really important. Have you ever thought of any display options that would tie the handwritten notes to the content? Uh, yeah, I think the notes are super important too. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I knew that, you know, getting scans of them was really important. It would be great to have, um, not only the scans, but have them sort of transcribed in text form as well. Um, although my grandfather's handwriting is a little hard to read at times, uh, but um, yeah, I don't know how they would be displayed. That's a really uh, good question that I'm gonna think about uh, further, um, but there is uh, definitely, it would be nice to have, you know, if there was an excerpt in particular that had a handwritten note with it to somehow tie those two together. And maybe that's just, uh, you know, even like putting the handwritten note, uh, a JPEG image or something into, you know, a video file. Uh, question, let's see, what else? Claire is asking, David, I'm wondering if you're leaning toward any particular approach towards digital storage. I think it's difficult to find an approach to storage that feels like it is accessible, maintainable for small scale and or DIY collections. So I'm curious to hear your perspective. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and one that definitely needs more thought. Um, my father, Jim Gris, who's on the call, I believe, um, set up an, a NAS uh, storage system at the, our house in Omaha. Um, I think um, what, what my thought process in terms of census as a family archive, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, different family members in different locations um, throughout the country um, could, you know, have, you know, their own hard drives or something like that. Um, so it's sort of, this is also a principle that Human Trash Jump is working off of. Um, our content's uh, primarily stored on archive.org. Um, but everything is downloadable. So every time someone downloads a digital file, uh, they're essentially, you know, sort of becoming part of a collective or community archive. Um, so the idea of sort of spreading the content out um, and sort of spreading it as far and wide as possible is sort of something that uh, I think about um, quite a bit. But yeah, in terms of really securing the files and making sure that they're, you know, uh, have proper checksums and things like that. I think that would probably be within, you know, a selection, a smaller selection of hard drives or something like that. But definitely something to keep considering. Um, Kurt asks, could you go into any more detail about the audio, auto transcription software process subtitling the videos? Um, so while I was at Marmia, actually, and I think uh, Siobhan's on the call too, um, while I was at Marmia, I was using Trent, um, which is sort of, is one of sort of several um, transcription softwares that uses um, sort of artificial learning or artificial um, intelligence. Um, so you essentially, you just upload the video or upload the audio um, content to their site and they generate a transcript uh, based on machine learning and then you kind of go back in and listen. You can kind of listen to whatever the content is while you're looking at the transcript. Um, and then you can, you know, edit accordingly. So I had to go back in quite a bit 
uh, when I was working at Marmia and when I was working on these files to sort of um, adjust different things or make sure that things were, you know, clearly stated um, in, you know, in the transcript or the subtitles. Um, but I could definitely, you know, if you want to shoot me an email, I can, we can go back into that process more. The, the paper uh, delves into that in a really um, more direct way, you know, in like a step-by-step -step process. So I'm happy to share uh, the paper once it's complete. Um, Greg asks, how did you balance your approach between personal digital archiving best practices and archiving the collection as works of art? How did you balance the personal being members of your family and professional aspects of this as well? Uh, those are good questions. Um, yeah, the personal and the professional. Um, there's kind of a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you sort of have to, I think, I mean, I was really inspired, you know, uh, Blanche Jocelyn, who was, um, you know, working as the MEAP technician in our intro class came and did a presentation uh, where she drew, you know, she showed us, uh, initially showed us Ashley Bluer's um, Minimal Viable Station. Um, and that really inspired me in a way that was like, I understand that like there are things that are, you know, quote unquote, best practices, but there is also this uh, urgency to, um, to archive these things and preserve these things that, you know, are on formats that are, are vulnerable to deterioration in various ways. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm still working on that balance, um, striking that balance. And it's really been case by case. For this particular collection, it was also difficult because, difficult and uh, really helpful actually though, um, because there had already been a lot of work that has, was sort of done on the collection, you know, like the, um, my, you know, my, my grandfather had enough, you know, forethought to sort of to realize that these things were important and to, you know, describe them as best he could and, and store them as best he could. Um, so I sort of think about that as like a lot of, when I think about best practice, I think a lot about what you can do as an individual or as, you know, a designated community. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, that as sort of like, the threat, the beginning threshold, and then sort of then what can be done from there in terms of maybe getting a grant or for storage or getting a grant for preservation or or some other aspect of that as well. Um, and in terms of family, I, it was difficult at times, um, to be honest. Um, this is a very personal subject. Uh, my uncle meant a lot to me and the family. Um, and so, yeah, so there was, uh, a lot of times where it was really hard and it was also really hard to sort of um yeah give a what would be maybe considered a non-bias approach you know or, or not thinking about it in terms of like you know this is uh content that i'm sort of personally invested in so that's something that i think uh, we as archivists grapple with all the time um you know how do you give uh you know, the same amount of care you would to, you know, like a family collection versus someone who is a stranger to you, you know, how do you think about that? So I think that's also something that I was thinking a lot about when I was working on this collection. Um, let's see. Yeah, great talks. <clears throat> something to think about for myself as well as great aunt uh, took meticulous notes as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think inherently like, you know, there are people who, you know, within families or within communities that uh, understand sort of the value of something they want it to, to, to live on. So, you know, they do take those meticulous notes or uh, meticulously document or, uh, in my case, create like over a hundred like, VHS tapes of like, just like what the family is doing um, in their everyday life. So, so yeah, really important. Um, Jacob, did you find the QC process for the transcription captioning difficult? Um, you know, yes, I think so. I mean, I think 
I haven't tried a ton of different, um, you know, ways to, to capture transcription or do transcription. I mean, Trent was one of the second or third, you know, softwares I've used. Um, it can get a little frustrating with the editing process. I know that was really a frustrating part, you know, playing back, replaying, playing back, playing, you know, like a really small section of, of audio to really understand maybe what the person is saying or even how to write it. There's a lot of, um, you know, in like regular speaking, there's a lot of repetition of words like, you know, and, and, or, uh, uh. And so those show up a lot in the transcript and it's like, do I edit those out or do I keep those in, you know, um, from like a archivist standpoint or from a clarity standpoint, you know, uh, when you think about subtitles in a movie or something like that. Um, so um, it was difficult and it still is difficult. Um, you know, there were times where I would think it was done, uh, download the sub rip file, you know, play it back with the video and then, you know, realize that, oh, you know, I kind of, maybe this should be different or I should move these, uh, this word to a different time code. Um, so yeah, there was definitely in some of that. Uh, Kim has a question. How, how you, how have you been in touch with the gallery? Have you been in touch with the galleries, museums, and institutions that have collected Bell's work? Uh, not yet. I'm sort of waiting to approach them, uh, in particular, like the Met. Um, I've, I've actually gone in person um, two separate times uh, with my partner. Um, we've gone to, and anyone can do this, actually. You can request uh, to view these works. If they're not on view, you can um, contact the Met to, to view them in person. Um, so I've had some contact with the Met in that way. So I have some email uh, exchanges there. I'm sort of waiting for, uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to approach them. And like, and it's also kind of like an issue of ownership for me. Like, uh, it's like, yeah, I've got this great content for your institution maybe and for the artwork that you're holding, but also, um, you know, this has relevant value to me and my family. Um, and how do we sort of share uh, that content, uh, how do I share that content between the institution, you know, sort of like, is there a contract drawn up? Um, so sort of like those kinds of things I'm, th I'm still thinking about. So I'm still trying to understand um, that as well. So yeah, Juan is saying, great question, Greg. There are so many intersections between your thesis and David's, yes. Yes, Greg and I have had several conversations um, <laughs> about family, about archiving, about small town culture in the Midwest. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've definitely connected in that way. So uh, yeah, thanks to Juana for that initial uh, push on the email, emailing Greg for his thesis uh, on his home movie collection. It's been uh, great to have that conversation together. Okay, this is a question from Joe. Uh, David, I can see that a lot of thinking went into coming up with your own DIY preservation method and that research and equipment storage, et cetera, et cetera was also somewhat demanding. What I'd like to know is after all the prep work you did at any point, experience what I call the OCD roadblock. <laughs> I know that many people, and I'm talking about regular folks trying to preserve their media home, home videos, feel stuck after researching methods and even buying equipment for their DIY preservation projects. Some people have said that they feel anxiety about not being able to truly future proof their digital files or not, or just not do a good transfer rip. Yeah. Um, I thought about that. I mean, you know, <clears throat> the equipment I use, the Canopus uh, 100 uh, came out like several years ago. I mean, it was more around the time that, I might be wrong about the uh, release date, but it was sort of more around the time of when uh, mini DV was really popular. So it was sort of like this unit that would create, you know, take your DV tapes and create a DV digital file of them. Um, so yeah, there's there's thoughts about that. I mean, I you know there's a couple of 
couple of tapes, I look at the digital file and I think, man, I really wish I would have had a TBC for some of this. There was like one in particular where the, you know, the side of the image is very wavy and it could really benefit from the use of a, a TBC in the workflow. Um, but yeah, I think the initial OCD roadblock, as you put it, um, I think, like I said earlier, I think do it and do it now and then just like do it. And then if you come across better equipment, if you, uh, you know, have some other uh, way to, you know, that comes up after doing more research. Um, but I think that initial step of just getting, you know, some of these things into digital file formats is really important. I mean, there's a whole lot of other stuff that happens afterwards, but I think that initial step can maybe reduce some of that anxiety. Um, and then always, you know, make sure you're always keeping the original source formats as well in case you um, do want to do another transfer of something. Okay, friend, I think you got one more question in there. I think yep. that will be final question yep. unless anyone has some burning thoughts and then we're going to do the unmute party. Okay, I think I see uh, the one last question is from Claire. Uh, I really love that you included captioning as part of your workflow. Uh, this is the first time I've seen a presentation presentation that included captioning where captioning wasn't the focus of the entire presentation. What do you think might make captioning workflows more feasible for more collections or are those workflow tools already accessible enough and we should just be a part of and should just be a part of every migration workflow. So um, Trent itself uh, for a student, Trent is uh, fairly expensive. Um, I, I was able to get, um, with the help of MEAP, was able to get uh, two months, two or three months, I think, um, for a subscription. Um, it was frustrating for me, it was really frustrating that it was subscription-based um, service as opposed to uh, software that you could download. Uh, we've really uh, moved our culture into a subscription-based world uh, where you have to have an account for each uh, whatever thing you're doing. Everything needs its own account and its own uh, passwords and its own like inputting of your credit card information, um, which is really frustrating. So that's sort of a roadblock that I'm seeing um, with that. I think captioning is really important um, as I stated in the video and as I state in my paper, um, there are certain aspects of specifically of um, my uncle's work um, that I wouldn't have understood fully if I hadn't have captioned it. Uh, connections to, um, you know, different things that he was thinking about or inspirations that he was having. Those are really important. Those end up being really important in the trans transcription and in the subtitles. Um, so I would say that there is definitely value in closed captioning. Uh, and in subtitles and in captioning in general. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's definitely something to think about. Um, you know, we're always thinking about ways to make things more accessible and thinking about what we are able to do within our means, um, even within institutions, you know, there are um, people with, you know, smaller budgets than others. So it, um, but yeah, I would love to see uh, maybe the ability to have captioning um, in just, you know, as a general uh, piece of the workflow that is just like anything else. Um, I think that's it. All right, well, congratulations. You, your presentation requirement is over. Only two <laughs> months left. Uh, so count of three, unmute and congratulate. One, two, three, yay! Yes, 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 yes.